when someone tells you that you sound like someone else, no matter what they're saying, they're giving you a compliment. No one listens to music they don't like. Ultimately, that's what makes music such a unique form, is that everyone really brings their own meaning to it, all the music. How did you go from this highly analytical, <laughs> highly technical, best in the world kind of program to standing in a pond in Japan singing Mamma Mia? I would say that the most damaging concept in human history is the idea of better or worse, even more than good and bad. I think ultimately you have to just think about it. You're making stuff for your friends and your, your family. If your friends and family don't care about what you're doing, then you should find new friends. Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something. It is TCU night, Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Eastern. We are live in our Discord, the Create Unknown Discord. If you're a Discord person, hey, look, if you're on your PlayStation, because apparently they're partnering now with Discord, you can hang out with us in the Create Unknown Discord. We are we are live with our patrons in the episode chat, our infantry, our $2 tots, our dumpster crew our illustrious baby gang, and we have a handful of lurkers as well. You don't have to be a patron to lurk. That is open to all. Creeps no, and we like love, to lurk around in the shadows. That's right. We love the lurkers and creepers just as much as as all the, the misfit children in, uh, in the Patreon. It's a different kind of love, though. We're a different kind of family, you know, but it's nice. We like, uh, we like getting you in, talking to you through the show. Uh, it really, really kind of adds to things. Um, but we're going to jump, we're going to jump right into this. Um, we have a really unique, very cool guest today. If you haven't jaunted across Japan to record yourself singing a cover of ABBA's Mamma Mia in very public spaces for 10 million people to watch, then you haven't lived. And that also means that, that you're not Austin Weber. His quirky video exploded and so did Austin's music career. His sound is kind of a charming, accessible bedroom pop with a, a lo-fi feel that is paradoxically polished. It's a really neat mix. He released the albums D42 in 2017, Love Songs for No One in 2019, and Late to the Party just a few weeks ago, back in March. His newest record has a bit more of a, a fuller four-piece sound uh, as an extension of the, the kind of Austin and a guitar beginnings. But his Twitter bio describes himself as if Andy Kaufman wrote love songs, which is one of the best bios ever. Uh, just yesterday, a new music video <laughs> dropped for Smokin', Schemin', Hopin', Dreamin'. What a title that is. And it's a delightfully poppy combo of kind of a 1970s AM radio and contemporary magnetism. So, uh, Austin, we've got we got stuff to talk about with the origin story of how you blew up and what it's been like to to grind out a music career online, especially as things change between 2015 and 2021. Uh, but first, what inspired the sound on Late to the Party? Oh, well, um, first of all, thank you so much for for that lovely intro. It's uh, it's incredibly flattering. <laughs> I, I uh, yeah, no, it's um. But uh, I oh first of all I'd like to give a big shout out to the baby gang too. I don't know who you are, but, hey but goddamn if I'm not a if I'm not already a fan of the baby gang <laughs> um, and, the, and the, the trash the trash people too. Um, <laughs> the dumpster but, crew, uh, <laughs> dumpster crew, yeah, the dumpster crew and the baby gang. I want to see them play a dodgeball game against each other. I think that <laughs> I think that would be great. Um, but uh, at, at any rate, um, the uh, the new record. You know, it's it's so hard describing your own music, or at least I find it really tough to describe exactly what it is I do, um, and then or what it is I sound like. But then every once in a while, like some other person will like drop in with like a lovely summation. Um, and uh, one of my really good friends, uh, who's directing my next uh, music video, a wonderful director named Christina Shing. Um, called this record uh like uh 
I, I don't remember exactly what she said. I'll actually have to ask her. But it's sort of like if the if the Beach Boys were if like late Beach Boys were working with Vampire Weekend. Um, and I was like, you know what? That's that's what that's great because the the late Beach Boys stuff and the uh, um, uh, late Beach Boys stuff and Vampire Weekend's new record were both on heavy rotation for me uh, when I was making this uh, when I was making late to the party. So she kind of she kind of hit the nail on the head there. Same with uh, um, if Andy Kaufman wrote love songs. That was uh, I, it was I wish I could have come up with something that good. But that was my one of my uh, lifelong mentors and, and old professor Stephen Prina, a sculptor from when I was back in art school. Um, but uh, yeah, no. So there's there's a funny a funny quote, a uh, funny quip I read the other day about the Beach Boys. I forget who said it. It's like, yeah, the Beach Boys, they have they have three kinds of songs. It's like, uh, look at that cute girl over there. Like, wow, your car goes really fast and I'm going to die alone. And, uh, <laughs> and so I was I was listening to all the I'm going to die alone records um, when uh, and then all the really poppy Vampire Weekend stuff um, and mo- a lot of other stuff. A lot of a lot of J.J. Kale on this record. You know, his early drum machine focused records are really, really big for in, in the pantheon of stuff I was listening to. Um I mean, like that's it's so hard for me to come up with uh, with with references um, that I have because there's just so many. It's like all you know, it's all jammed in there. Um, but uh, again, I'm sort of straying from the question. I'm sure you have a list of better ones for me to answer or <laughs> not better than that question. But <laughs> that you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. always dicey. I didn't even though, have a coffee when... today. Look at me go. <laughs> it's dicey when when you're talking to an artist and, and you, you say that, you know, you want to, you want to give them a compliment. That's like, Oh, this reminds me of, of whatever, or, you know, you sound like this, you, you look like that, but you can never, almost never be certain, uh, that it's, it's not going to be offensive, you know? So like, if you, I'm trying to think of an example, you know, like if I'd said something, you know, that, that didn't fit, like, I'm sure you've had comparisons where somebody said, oh, this reminds me of whatever. And you're kind of like internally fuming. That's like, <laughs> I don't want to sound like that. I, I wasn't going uh, for that. But like, I, yeah, I have had that reaction before, but, but not for a while. I mean, I think that's a sign of, of sort of an artistic immaturity. Um, you know, when you're not confident in your own stuff enough and not and when you don't understand, like, you know, uh, when someone tells you that you sound like someone else, they're give, no matter what they're saying, they're giving you a compliment. Uh, right. because you don't, no one, I was, I, I thought of this the other day that this specific example, like no one, no one listens to music. They don't like, like no one, no one remembers music. No one even knows the name of musicians. They don't like, or they know the name of musicians <laughs> they don't like, but like, they don't know the name of musicians that are bad. Like someone asked me to like, tell them ba- like some bad music the other day. I'm like, why would I ever know that? Why would I listen to that? If it's bad, I just won't. So when some, no matter what happens, if someone tells, tells this, and this goes for everyone, everyone in the room right now, when someone tells you that you remind them of someone, uh, uh, artistically, it's, it's, a uh, it's, it's, it, you should always take it as a compliment. People are not remembering people that they don't like or I, interacting with your stuff if they don't like it. Can I tell you a totally awkward and non-artistic <laughs> moment that was horrible in my life where this happened to me. (laughs) Okay, so... Yeah, of course. Many, many years ago, I was a (laughs) busboy at a restaurant. Um, Uh What kind? um, A bistro, American bistro, like a, uh, you know, Mm. mid-tier kind of, uh, like, not fancy restaurant, but, like, it's, like, butting up against kind of fancy. It's like a bar and grill, you know? So... So I'm a bus boy, and I don't Uh remember, you know, how old I was, maybe 17 or something like that. And at the time, this is going to give away who they said I, I, I looked like, but um, at the time, a very popular commercial had to do with the Verizon guy. And it was this guy oh, no. who would say, can you hear me now? And the, this, this <laughs> campaign went on forever. Uh, those familiar with the Verizon guy will know that he like later became the Sprint guy. They like Sprint brought him yeah. back and was like, now I'm the Sprint guy. Now there is no Sprint anymore because like T-Mobile swallowed them or something. So it shows yeah. like how well that went. But anyway, I'm bussing tables and this woman goes, 
Oh my God, you look, did anyone ever tell you you look just like the Verizon guy? And I'm 17. This caught me off guard. I'm just trying to bring them bread and water. And I must have reacted really like <laughs> annoyed or awkwardly. I don't know. Like I didn't have the social graces or, uh, you know, like the kind of like the social um, muscles developed to like react in a way that wasn't awkward. I was really weird about it because it it it. it I was like, what? <laughs> and, <laughs> and it created this such weird moment where like this woman and her boyfriend or husband or something, all of a sudden they felt really bad. And she was like, oh my God, like I didn't mean that in a bad way. And I was like, ah, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and I basically <laughs> just walked away. Uh, and luckily, uh, as a busboy, I didn't like have to go back to that table because I wasn't the waiter until, you know, yeah. I like cleaned up later. But I always remembered that because one, I just... I, I, I was like, why are you com comparing me to the Verizon guy? Like, that's not flattering. I, it's not like, hey, no, I, I, you look I like Johnny the, Depp. I would have been like, like wow. General, <laughs> general rule is that you should never tell someone ever, no one, that, that you they look like someone else. No matter, I can't even conceive of someone who is so perfect looking that I would be told that I look like them and be happy about it. Like, even if someone, you know, someone comes up to me and you're like, hey, you look like Tom Brady. My first reaction would be like, no, I don't. And then my second reaction would be like, <laughs> I, my chin is that big. Like, I like I look like Frankenstein. <laughs> like, when you, people, everyone is like, I've never met anyone who who would react to saying that someone that they look like someone in a positive way. There's just there's no there's no way it must be something like inbuilt with our with our big old dumb brains that. We don't like what when we're compared to how other people look. That yeah. that that is. Yeah. I remember when I was in uh when I was in middle school. I was at Starbucks with my with my friends, and and I was waiting for my drink, and there was this old guy sitting in a uh like a like a lounge like a lazy boy you know lounge chair that they you know the kind they used to have at Starbucks when they were like little living rooms. Um, he was sitting by the drink things, and I got my drink, and he was. He told me I look like Elon Musk. And keep in mind, I'm in like <laughs> eighth grade. And and I don't know who Elon Musk is. And the only reason I remember it is because I remember just going like being like, oh, OK. And then sort of walking away and being like, who the fuck is Elon Musk? <laughs> and, That's and look creepy. At, like, what a creepy right? old man. Who, who <laughs> what? says it's just that like, to strange eighth graders? <laughs> right. And and it and was he it, wearing a trench it, coat? Did he offer you no, candy? Did he, he have a, he, a paneled van with with no windows? He looked like a perfectly <laughs> nice but obviously socially <laughs> awkward dude. <laughs> but but the point remains that you should never tell anyone who they look like because mm -hmm. that's that's never going to make anyone feel good. Yeah, unless they're like universally known for being extra hot. Like I think that's okay. Yeah. If someone's like, hey, you look like. A Brad Pitt or uh, George Clooney or so. Who's hot now? Um, I'm such a boomer. Who's who's uh, Brad, who's Brad like a Pitt hunk is now? a good example. Brad Pitt is a yeah. good example of someone who. Yeah, if if someone told no me I look like Brad that. Pitt, no, I wouldn't. I would not be mad about that. You're absolutely right. <laughs> well, no, but but there's but always you a don't chance. know. So yeah, it's a question. You, it's like, not worth it. This is like a, there's like no a calculus limit thing <laughs> where like there are just things that trend towards zero and never quite get there. There is no absolute yeah. zero of comparison. So like Brad Pitt, even uh, I, I don't know exactly how old he is now, but he's not young now. So you could say that and it's conceivable that somebody would be like, oh, God, I do. I look 48, you know, like. I'm in my late 30s. If somebody said I looked like Brad Pitt, it's possible I could think, God, do I look like 10 or 15 years older than Old I really Brad am? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so even with that, like it seems it's a safe bet. It's a safe bet if you pull one of those classical, there, like yeah, classically just, hot men or there's women. There's no but... <laughs> situation in which you couldn't just tell the person like, hey, you look great. That that will make someone feel way better than saying, hey, you yeah. look like this other person. <laughs> well, is that how it is with with uh, creative stuff, with art? Would you rather have well, somebody say just like, I like your music and leave it at that? I mean, like, yes, yes, I, I sort of would. But I mean, the big difference is that, you know, when you're making stuff, when you're creating stuff, you you have all sorts of different agency and all sorts of different input and intention that can go into it. 
um, you know, when you're talking about appearance, like we don't, we can't do anything about it. Yeah. There's uh we're not, we're, we're not agents of ourselves, you know, but, but when it comes to music, like I love the beach boys. Like I love the, all those, like, and I, I was a huge fan of the new vampire weekend record. And, you know, I mean the other, like if someone came up and like, you know, the, the times when, I don't know, it's just different, I think. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I think you're right that, um, I would probably rather have people just say like, Hey, I really like how that sounds. But the problem, especially with music more so than I think any other medium is that there's not a great vocabulary, uh, to describe how things sound mm -hmm. certainly in, in the American vernacular and, and sort of even within like the, the critical sphere of, of music writers writing about music, like there's not a good way of talking about it. You know, there's a reason that we know the names of movie critics, but we don't know the names of music critics. Like music criticism right. is not a, a well-rounded and um, and like really uh, pronounced field, and certainly one that hasn't captured the you know the lexography of of how we talk about music. You know, you music is so felt that. Um, uh, well, you know, I don't really know why. I mean, I think that's something worth thinking about, maybe. But um, it is interesting that, uh, you know, the the vernacular doesn't include so many good ways to talk about music. Um, mm -hmm. So I do think you, I think do you read music reviews. More, um, I, I do. And I'm sort of uh, perennially um, uninspired by them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's so easy to listen to. Well, that's another thing. Like, when someone's reviewing a record, you can just go out and listen to the record, you know, but I don't know. I mean, there's different value assigned to different art in, um, in the, uh, in, in the world for lack of a better word. And I, you know, I was talking to one of my friends about this the other day. Uh, she's a, she's a, a, a director and she was going to make some commercials and she was saying like hey i don't know if i want to do make make commercials you know might might devalue my work as a as a director but it's like no that's not how it works in in the movie world you know if i found out that like pta directed that sprint commercial i'd be like oh hell yeah cuz cuz the creator um is not as directly tied to the work as say in a musical context where a much higher degree of agency is automatically assumed for for the artist. Um, but uh, and anyway, we've got sort of a, a little bit of a sidetrack there, I think. But but needless to say, uh, I don't remember what the question was. Well, I like I like <laughs> thinking about and talking about this music review thing because I, I I have never thought about it before, and I don't listen to or sorry, I don't read music reviews. I don't watch YouTubers who review music because the times that I have tried, you're right. The things that they're saying, it is almost word salad. It's almost meaningless. It's it's like, okay, those words that you're using, I don't understand how they really translate to what I'm hearing and what I'm feeling. And that is a very bizarre thing. Um, do you think it's because you bring so much of yourself to listening to music as opposed to like a movie review or reviewing a television show you can talk about the character character arcs and plot development and lighting and cin cinematography and the music choices uh yeah. the, you know um plot holes there are so many kind of tangible um things to analyze in film and tv whereas in music you're like well this good fuzzy guitar sound is staticky you know i'm like i don't know what that means yeah well i mean there's there's a lot of great writing about music you know and there's a lot of great music writers and there's a lot of great writers who can use music in their writing it to, to really great effect but i i think i think the problem is some is sort of peculiar to trying to describe what things sound like which is invariably comical and uh just because it's like watching someone try to um like you know it's like a it's like a monty python sketch where it's just like 
someone trying to do an activity that's impossible. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, um, Richard Wright is an example of a, of a writer who, who uses, who can write very, very well and eloquently about music, but I wouldn't call his stuff like music reviewing exactly. Um, and there's a lot of great, you know, historiography about music. Um, but I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's nothing that compares to just like, like the music is, yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. You said something early on where about, um, about how much of yourself you bring to the music. I think that's spot on. I mean, ultimately, that's what makes music such a unique form, you know, such a wonderful thing to work with is that everyone, more so than any other thing I've ever experienced, really brings their own meaning to, to all the songs, you know, all the, uh, all the music, you know, mm -hmm. all the music. But I mean, that's one thing that's really cool is, you know, a lot of my songs are about really specific things that are that feel really sort of peculiar to me or particular to me or my friends or you know whatever a certain experience um but the more specific you make stuff um musically or lyrically you know the more general it sort of becomes like who hasn't listened to tangled up in blue and gone like fuck yeah like that is how i feel right now like and and you're thinking about all this this tapestry of, of of your own life in this song, you know, none of us has ever like gone up to the great north woods and worked as a cook for a spell, you know. <laughs> but like it's sort of inherently when Dylan tells us that that's what he's doing in your head, like you are doing that too, you know, but maybe your version of going to the great north woods and working for a cook for a, as a spell, you know, is like yeah, I went to like indianapolis and like worked on a commercial for a month and like but you know we all have that those those connections uh that are sort of baked into music and it must be something hardwired with with our brains you know because it's it's probably has something to do with um i don't know you you sort of make those connections also when when you're reading poetry and and definitely when you're when you're reading novels to sort of a a lesser extent but but the conciseness the concision of like the form of of a song is is super important i think to the ultimate ineffability of of reviewing exactly what it is that's going on because ultimately a song what, is three minutes you know what's it what's it like working in uh in a different medium you mentioned having uh, a, a sculpting professor in the past. So at that point, I'm thinking you've you've dabbled in uh, more than just music and have gone kind of deeply into it. So what what is the difference when you paint something, sculpt something, uh, make a song, right? Uh, with with all these things that we're talking about, about uh, how they hit other people, how you feel about them. Yeah. Do you have any perspective on those differences at this point? Oh yeah, I mean I. I think about that pretty often. Um, I mean, I think it's, uh, well, hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to think for, for just a second. Well, well first, um, what other stuff, uh, what other mediums, uh, do you deal in? Uh, well in, in college, uh, I was, a I I was a double major. I, I, uh, in writing classical music and, uh, it, making sculptures. I was a sculptor, a music major, okay. um, at Harvard. And, uh, and so there was just like, uh, those were really sort of two different worlds, but you know, work wise, but then sort of the thought processes that go along with it, um, are, are really similar sort of no matter what you're making. Uh, cause so much of it is just like knowing what you want, you know? Uh, and, and the, the lesson I learned in all my classes, you know, rigorous, whatever is just that you gotta go to bat for your own work. Like you have to make stuff that you believe in. And that's the stuff that ultimately like really connects with people is, is stuff that you, uh, stuff that you care about. Um, I mean, I remember when I, when I got to, when I got to college, I, I skipped right into, um, I, I skipped right into like the, the graduate program for, uh, electroacoustic composition. So it was, it was basically me and like a bunch of, a bunch of like, 
30 year old grad students. And I was this 18 year old kid and I really had no idea what I was doing. You know, I, I, I've been making music my entire life. Um, but I'd never thought critically about it in the way that like a, a 30 year old Harvard grad student does, which is just a different beast. And I remember thinking that way, you know, thinking that, oh, I'm not thinking about it in the same way. Um, or like, whatever, I it felt like there was a- anyway, I, w- I remember just like really going out and, and, and trying to make stuff, not for me, but like for the, you know, that I thought would would be good. You know, you, you make stuff that you think is, is going to be good, rather than the stuff that you actually want to make and, and care about. And, and my, my mentor, well, the guy who later became my, my mentor, you know, my, my advisor, um, for, for, you know, to this day, uh, this wonderful, wonderful composer and like amazing guy named Hans Tushku, like took me aside after class one day and was just like, Austin. Um, and he's, he's saying this all in, in like a, a wonderful, uh, East German accent. Um, like Austin, like you gotta, like, I can tell that you're saying a lot of stuff, you're writing stuff and it's good, but you gotta make stuff that you want to make. Like, I can tell that you're sort of fronting. I, he, I, do not think he said I was fronting, but that <laughs> I was, was going to say, it's like, I can tell you are fronting. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you know, needless to say, he, he just like basically called me out. He was like, yeah. dude. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a, that was a tough thing for me to hear at, at 18. You know, I, back then I felt like I was really mature, but of course, you know, I was 18 and, right. but you know, it, it's experiences like that, 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 made me come into my own as an artist um uh where you you know you sort of realize hey i don't have to answer to anybody um and and when someone says like why did you do this i can answer them if i have an answer but the answer can really just be like i wanted to like fuck off i like what i made and and this is what i'm doing now it's um, like the the meme of david lynch when someone is asking him to expand on something and he just goes no <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that? Have you seen that yeah. video? I mean, he's he's a legend in in that way. And I mean, his movies are so uh, like you can tell that it's just baked with intention. Like he he that's what makes them so compelling is when you're watching a Lynch movie or, you know, Twin Peaks or really anything he does, uh, you you feel like you're someone is like carrying you through the story. You know, it's not when you're watching Lynch, it's not comfortable. You know, you're not there and like a like a baby, it, but but you can tell that you you're there with like a, a trustworthy guide who knows what he's doing, and you know he sort of takes care of you, in the same way that you feel when you listen to you know like a Bach organ fugue is is just like you're you're listening to someone who's so confident and they know what they're doing. Um, you know, the same way you feel like when you listen to Joni Mitchell play, it's 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 all. It's all the same, you know. When you look at a Picasso painting, um, it's or, or it's the thing that separates. There's like an ineffable quality of of intention and uh, decisive action um, that that separates sort of the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, but a lot of that we, just has to do with like we move confidence. On, uh, yeah. Austin, real quick, what in the world is electroacoustic composition? <laughs> is, is, is that not like a, a contradictory thing? Like, what does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked because, boy, do I not really know how to explain it. Um, it, it it's basically like uh, it's combining electronic elements with um, with with tradi- more traditional classical music stuff. So, you know, if I, I spend a lot of time writing music, not only for string quartets, but you know, for string quartet plus um, effects. So you know, there are there are special programs like, uh, like the most well used one is this thing called Max MSP, which is basically like an open source um, music tool where it's your coding. It's like music coding. So you know, it'll say like, okay, when you know, it's a lot of if then statements like most coding. So like if the sound goes above zero decibels if it you know it goes above negative two decibels then this effect is applied for the next two seconds right 
Uh, and so basically you can imagine how that escalates really quickly to these incredibly complicated, like Rube Goldberg esque programs. Yeah. And, and so that it's basically like, you know, like normal classical music is like two guys fighting, right? Electroacoustic composition is like two guys fighting in like Iron Man suits. You know, it basically, <laughs> you're, you're using all the tools that, uh, electronics affords us to um make music and and it's sort of electro it's called the that's just what the lab was called you know uh the the husiak harvard university uh i don't know what the s stands for uh electro uh electroacoustic composition um i have no idea what the s stands for but uh um point is is just like it's like galaxy brain music. <laughs> I was going to say galaxy it's sort of brain. What it feel I was like. going to say galaxy brain. I can't believe you said that. <laughs> the whole time I was think I, I was going to interject and say, so this is like galaxy brain composition. <laughs> yeah, no, pre pretty much. Like they should just call it like the next that. level stuff. Galaxy brain comp composition. That would make more sense. <laughs> but what's really funny is like tons of overlap uh, with like house music and stuff in, in that in that little world and like. Uh, Anyway, so that's that's what electroacoustic acoustic music is kind of. Um, but you know, it's basically like I instead of composing for a string quartet, I'm composing for a string quartet and this array of sixty speakers we have set up all around you in like a giant dome. Um, you know, it's uh, it's, it's really like Futurama. Fun. It's like <laughs> yeah, it, it's, Beethoven's it, head in a jar in Futurama. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like the it's like what you imagine people would be listening to like four thousand years from now. Uh, <laughs> it's but and it's really it's it's but that stuff is more like watching a movie, you know, because it's so gestural and so um, like sort of abstract. Uh, it 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 has a lot of connections with um, like experimental film, uh, you know, the montage uh you know i don't know the of course it started in france and germany um but anyway enough enough about that uh <laughs> that's 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 what i spent a lot of my time in college doing was that and 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 making sculptures um which which again you know has sort of the same thought process like you you look at a calder mobile and and you just know this dude saw it and made it and it's a it's complete and it speaks you know it's an intelligible sentence is sort of a good way of putting it you know when uh if if an untrained sculpture sculptor like makes something just like a like a thing you know it's like writing is it's like you know how to you know english words but you don't know how to put them all together in a way that makes sense um but when you when you work when you when you sort of learn the language and learn how form and function work, then uh, then you can start to speak in these really eloquent sentences um, it, with with form uh, in the same way we are talking to each other right now with words. Mm -hmm. How did you go from how did you go from this highly <laughs> analytical, highly technical, really uh, best in the world kind of program to standing in a pond in japan singing mamma mia like what is the what is the progression here from a to b because it doesn't seem like a straight line well my friend the that that is uh because it's sort of it's it's it feels like galaxy brain stuff but galaxy brain <laughs> stuff doesn't have to be complicated it can be whatever you want it to be and so like for example the first really eloquent work of art I think I ever made was this video that I made. There was a video installation I made for a sculpture class my sophomore year of college. And it was called, uh, it's up on YouTube if you want to see it. It's, it's the first video on my channel. It's, it's called Running Past a Stereo Pair of Microphones While Screaming at the Top of My Lungs. Um, and in the video, I... Uh, run past a stereo pair of microphones while screaming at the top of my lungs. And it, the, it, I made it in, you know, a sculpture class. That's what I showed at like a, a big end of year exhibition, uh, 
you know, it screened alongside all of the really, like, I remember it screened after this, like, long documentary one of my friends made about the plight of Syrian refugees in Germany. Um, and <sighs> oh my God. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was <laughs> so, but everyone at the department knew me well enough to see my name and, like, see the title on the program and be like, okay, like, we're getting Austin next. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but, uh, you know what you what i what you learn is that anything you make is just as valid as anything else you know so when i showed that nobody came up to me and said like like you know what what is that like the the more um the better at making stuff people become right the more uh open they become right the the more accepting they become cuz you just know good work is good work you know like it, it's like when you're a, when you, it's like a level of maturity. Like when you're a, when you're, when you're eight, you see a Ferrari pass on the street and you're like, oh, like that's so cool. You know, like, wow. And then, you know, when you're 15, you see the same Ferrari pass you and, and you'll be like, yeah, that's, I, I've seen Ferraris before. Like, that's cool. I don't care. And then, <laughs> you know, you reach a certain level of maturity where like now if I see a, like a Ferrari pass me on the street, like I have no qualms going like, holy shit, that's cool as hell. Um, you know, I don't know if that analogy makes sense. But needless to say, you know, when I played that at the big, you know, exhibition at the end of the year, like everyone loved it. They all saw it, watched it and it's funny and they laughed. And there no one ever asked a question of like, you know, what? why did you do that? Like, why did you bring it here? Like, you know. And it would no it the question was ever even raised like uh, that it didn't fit or it wouldn't fit. No one had any qualms with it because you know it's it was good, well thought out work. You know it 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 made a statement and it was it was sort of like my own proof to myself that like if if you have an idea and like um, execute in a in a meaningful and and concise way and you you sort of complete the sentence so to speak. You're not you don't have to use fancy words to to say things that people want to hear, you know, and uh, and so the jump from, you know, what may seem like high academia to um, what may seem like low uh, art is is seamless. You know, it's uh, it's a continuum. It's one and the same. Um, you know, there's a reason that uh, some of the that the most famous painting in the world is is of a soup can you know <laughs> right yeah so yeah. so well, this is this is part yeah. of a concept that i'm kind of obsessed with and i don't think anybody's been able to articulate it well but i've seen it in memes use using a bell curve where essentially at like the bottom of the bell curve let's use your ferrari example um at the bottom of the bell curve you have wow a ferrari and then the huge chunk in the middle is like this judgment zone of like Ferraris are lame and here's like all of the problems with them or here are all the other things that are better than Ferrari. And then at the top of the bell curve, you go back to, wow, a Ferrari. Yeah. So, like it so, takes a, it takes a real fucking stuck up asshole to look at anything in the world and be like, yeah, like whatever. Like, you know, people like shit. <laughs> people, if people make things that they want to make, you know, you have to take people on face value. And, and, uh, if you like something, then, then just like it. And if you don't like it, then you don't have to deal with it, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, another, another example yeah. is like the bottom of the bell curve is, uh, Frankenstein is the monster. And then the middle of the bell curve is Frankenstein is not the name of the monster. And then the top is Frankenstein <laughs> is the monster. But it's that <laughs> yeah. same kind of thing where like in the middle you have like this noise of people being like, actually, the the Frankenstein is the name of his, the monster's creator, Dr. Frankenstein. The yeah, monster those, is those just, just his like monster. People with, and, like, they feel like they got something to prove, you know, like, no, like no one's no one's better than that. I mean, you know, that was that's that's really the lesson I learned in in like the high academia world um, was like. You know, like no one's better than that. Like you're not going to hear like your your English professor like correct you that like actually is Frankenstein is the guy, not the monster. Like, no, they're not going to say that because it's just like who gives a shit. Um, <laughs> and so and so I mean, so much so 
that my that love songs for no one that record and the music videos that went along with it were my thesis they were my they were my harvard thesis um and and not only did they i got summa cum laude uh and they won the thesis prize like that's how much the bell curve is that's how much like that circle is real where like people you just stop caring was like i <laughs> I remember going to like the award ceremony, you know, at the, for, for all the thesis awards. Um, there were like, there were, there's maybe like 20 theses a year that, that win this prize. And it's really funny. Cause now, now that my record and like all the music videos and whatever, they're like a, in the permanent collection of the Harvard libraries, you know, alongside all these other like epic tomes and they're announcing what people did. And they're like, this, this man, you know, cured five forms of cancer. And like this, <laughs> you know, she solved all of our economic problems. And they're like, this guy made, made a bunch of music videos. He wrote some songs and uh, that's, that's what he did. And, uh, but, you know, not a single person ever, like throughout my whole time ever treated what I was doing as not only lesser, but just like any different from from anything that anyone else was doing. Like not not once in my time at Harvard did anyone like stick up their nose and they're like, "Hmm, you write songs. Goodbye." Uh, you know, it was always <laughs> you know very, very you know because ev everyone no one has anything to prove. You know, no one's trying to prove that they're better than anyone else. And so I I bring my my uh, my. That guy who freshman year, my professor who told me that I had to like get my shit together, Hans, you know, he was my thesis advisor and, you know, I play him all the songs and, and he's just a genius. Uh, first of all, he's just a genius, a musical mind, unlike any I've ever met before. Um, and, uh, um, he was just like listening to these pop songs and making suggestions of pure genius, like right here. You need to add this note. Like a good example is in I'll Be Fine, there's one note that leading into the guitar solo, there's a slide guitar note uh, that goes and sort of sustains into the first bar of the guitar solo. And I originally I played him the track without that. And uh, or, you know, he it was his idea. Yeah, I played the track as it was. And he was like, sounds great but there's something missing. And I'm like, I know, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't sound whole. And he's like, right here, like you need to like, there's it's just like something there. Uh, and he, he played that note for me. He's like, this note has to go there and that'll make it, you know, that might make it work. Of course he was right. Um, but, uh, you know, I could, I can tell you more about the systems. That's kind of an interesting thing to go into, but sort of needless to say, uh, I've never, I never once got a nose thumbed at me. Um, yeah. uh, and yeah, I, and so much so that I never even thought I would get a nose thumbed at me. You know, once you, once you really commit to what you're doing, um, it, there's sort of no limit to the, to the shit you can come up with. <laughs> uh, there are a couple things that I, that I want to jump on here. And one of them is, is that, uh, that nose thumbing thing it's it's really important that it doesn't happen and so uh, back in the 90s uh since since you're talking about harvard back in the 90s they had a course uh by uh from a historian william ganap that was about um i think they called it uh baseball in american life something like that hmm. and uh nobody nobody in the department of history there thumbed their nose at that even though i guess in the kind of the annals of history, baseball is probably, you know, not in the top hundred most important topics. Uh, but <laughs> William Gnapp used things like, he's like, hey, look at stadiums and you can tell a lot about how America is developing. So places like Fenway Park in the teens, that's built, it's right uh, kind of downtown. It's uh, uh, something that you walk to, you can take the subway to versus Dodger Stadium in the sixties, which is many, many miles outside of a city and has parking for like 20,000 cars. You can look at those two different stadiums at different eras and know what's different about those cities. What's changed about the people living in them. It, oh, there's a lot absolutely. to unpack there. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and I a mean, lot of people just just the like, idea I got a lot of, of shit. baseball. Yeah. You yeah, can, I, got, I got a lot of shit for taking that <laughs> class because I was young and people were like, uh, why are you wasting your time? You go to that place, you you spend your time at, at this world famous institution so that you can fuck did, around. Did you baseball? go to Harvard? What's wrong with you? No, I just pretended to for a short time. Uh, I went, uh, I took some classes there and then, uh, did my degree, uh, on the better side of the Charles. I, I went to Boston university, so oh, nice. I know the, yeah, the you spot, know, the neighborhood. Uh, yeah. Well. yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, that's why when we were talking about wings over, I wondered if you'd had it. I, I know the but, logo. Um, yeah, I've never the had it. Awesome. By the time I, you know, in my, my era, uh, was all about raisin canes was the place to go if you yes. wanted chicken. Um, yeah. So, so wings over, I, I can't say I ever went there, but I know <laughs> that, you know, it's a little thing that like goes like that. Um, it's a good logo. Yeah. Wait, wait, uh, before we that, get too deep into chicken lore, who, who was giving you grief for taking this, what sounds to me like a really cool, uh, baseball class? Well, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't want to dox my enemies list because I've been keeping <laughs> one since probably 1995, you know, it's in my wallet. Uh, but, uh, the other courses that I were taking were economics courses. And it really was a question of like, Hey, this thing economics is obviously useful to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, baseball is a throwaway class. Well, it, it really wasn't, uh, that, that, uh, set the tone really for a, a fair bit of my life for looking at things se that are seemingly frivolous and they actually aren't at all, you know, and, and you can pull the value out of that. And I'm so glad the second thing that I really want to say here is I'm so glad you said that it's seamless to go, uh, from high culture to low culture, that there's no difference here. And Kevin brings up this bell curve meme where the high end and the low end are the same. Uh, a lot of people don't believe it works that way. And I think, you know, it's tough to see it until you have experience, you know, dipping your toes in that high end. Uh, but there's this skepticism that's like, if I get uh, formally trained in art, I'm just going to sound like my teachers. If I, you know, do anything else, like uh, it's going to be derivative in some way. You know, I've got to uh, uh, I've got to be independent in all ways. You know, I don't want a mentor because I just want to figure it out myself. That's yeah, I mean, the I prevailing think, I think wisdom. those people just like aren't comfortable in their own skin, you know, and that's like a, it's a definite hump to get over. I mean, like at the, we were everyone. And I think the, the key sort of throughout is patience. You know, everyone who is comfortable in their own skin was once not and may not be again, you know. Um, and so like you just don't argue with people. You know, if someone wants if someone wants to correct you that Frankenstein was the was actually the guy's name, don't go back at him and be like, um, "Why do you care so much?" You know, just be like, <laughs> "Yeah, sure, <laughs> you're yeah, you're right." Um, you know, it, and and there's sort of like, it's all about people thinking they're better than other people or thinking that other people are better than them. And it's just like this weird, you know, value assigning ecosystem that that gets you really um, it just it just is bad. Like, it just doesn't matter. You know, I can't assign I can't I it's hard to like even say something about it because it just is so just people, everyone, hopefully to lead a happy and fruitful life. I think everyone will just it, eventually people will just figure out that it doesn't matter, you know. Do you realize, though, that if everybody followed your advice, there would be virtually no interactions on the Internet? It, like <laughs> everybody would just kind of log in, check the weather and then shut their computer down. Well, no, because then people would be saying truly interesting things like uh, like instead of like like the goddamn like Rolling Stone 500 best records of all time type list, you know, right. like these are the 30 yeah. best guitarists of the late 2010s. And you're like. Who the fuck cares? You know, that's not <laughs> actually interesting. That's just like, uh, that's just something pretending to be interesting, written by somebody pretending to have interesting ideas. Um, you know, like a really, a truly interesting thing would, would be like, you know, talking about actually the, the records, you know, it, it's not, I don't know, it's just not interesting to say things are better than other things. Uh, like that's the lamest thing anyone could possibly say. Uh, so I, if we were all sort of on the same page about nothing mattering and 
value being meaningless, I, I think we'd we'd actually get things done for once uh, and be happy because, you know, then we're not comparing things with other things, which is ultimately how you get into trouble in any part of your life, you know? But aren't some things better than others? I mean, so, so look, I mean, you mentioned, uh, no, but see, that's a, that's a dangerous box, path box to go down. I, I, I have to pitch this to you. You've got to give a solid answer on this. Yeah. Are these two, are these two compositions equal? One of box fugues and warrants cherry pie. Are these two <laughs> the same thing in terms of oh. cultural value, musical value, artistic value? Are they equivalent? A hugely, hugely equivalent. And I, and I say this as someone who like, loves Bach fugues like it's my it's my favorite thing to to do um is just to like sit down in a on my couch and like you know you know the uh you know the Maxwell guy um yeah the sitting in the chair and his the, hair gets sitting in the chair. Back. yeah that's like that's how I feel <laughs> oh, when I listen one. to right a, that's how I feel when I listen to like Bach fugues it's like it's it's like the like the THX logo is coming over the Maxwell guy um my my brother had that poster on his wall when he was in high school, and and that was in the 1980s. So I I wonder how many people listening know that that Max L poster. <laughs> I, I'm amazed that, that that's something that like Kevin or I would have brought up and and then groaned about. <laughs> yeah, because we, when would we get realized made fun that of. none of the kids yeah. would know. <laughs> no one knows so what we're it. talking about. Yeah, well, it I, is classic. It's though. a it's it a classic. it's a classic thing. I think everyone knows the image of the uh, of the maxwell couch guy even if they don't know it's a maxwell yep. thing like the same way everyone knows the picture of the two incredibly fat guys on motorcycles like that is a part of american cultural memory we all know the fat twins on the motorcycles it just it <laughs> right. we just do um and if you don't it, out the pe- listeners out there if you don't think you know look it up and you'll go, oh, yeah, those guys. Um, that was on the cover of the Guinness Book of World Records in the school library. That's I remember so, funny. so distinctly the image where the guys have mustaches and like dark yeah. sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. No, it's no. black and white and like co- really yep. contrasty. Yeah, everyone knows that. Yep. Picture. I'm convinced. That's nuts. That's nuts that that. Yeah, we, we saw this like in our respective 1990s moments or something and <laughs> know exactly 30 years later this uh niche photograph yeah and it's but it's so it's so striking and it's like so good like the photograph it's such a it's so funny you know it's a perfect joke it's a it's a perfect joke um and it's like a it's very it's like something that only like john schwartzwelder could have written it's like a it, it's something that feels like it, it has existed forever, you know, like a, a joke that has no sense of time or place. It just is, you know, um, but uh, we were talking about something and then and then got side. Oh, yeah. Bach versus Warren. Um, right. I mean, they're just different, you know, and and the values of them are different, but equal, you know, they, if you had like, a Sophie's, if you're, Sophie's if you're, choice if moment, who do you save? If if those are the two <laughs> options, which one well, do you choose? Well, that though? comes that comes down to a, a preference, um, which is different than good or bad, or even like or dislike. You know, if if I was living, if you know, you walk into like a dive bar, you don't want to hear box organ fugues. Like I fucking <laughs> I fucking love box organ fugues. Like it's true. I, that would be the I'll creepiest thing all time. ever. T- right? Talk about just, Lynchian. That would be like a right David Lynch thing. horror yeah. horror setting. Right. But and so you can't say that one is better or worse than the other. They're just they're just different. You know, when you walk into a dive bar and they're playing cherry pie and you just get to be like, she's my cherry pie. And you're just like, <laughs> fuck, yeah. You know, that's or, or that's, a that's what you want to hear there. Can you, you imagine want, a Fourth you know? of July barbecue listening to Box Fugue or a Fourth of July barbecue listening to Warren's cherry pie? This is right. not a, a choice. It's obvious. No. If you, no, if you walk absolutely. into Brookline, though, since we were talking Boston, if you make your way into Brookline, you will almost certainly see some barbecues with, with classical music playing in the background. Such is That's true. <laughs> such really? is the population. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it's a, dip, it's a, a different barbecue. They're a funny it's neighborhood. It's a different kind of it's barbecue. It's a different barbecue. 
But that's that was the point. Yeah, is that even as far as barbecues go, you're going to have that massive range from uh, the cherry pie barbecue to the Bach barbecue. And uh, that could be <laughs> in the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, with that geography, Alston turns into Brookline and uh, what's happening on on one side of the avenue is very different than what's happening on the other one uh, culturally. Yeah. It's very true. Um, and it is, is one better or worse? I don't know. Well, I mean, no, that, uh, if I had to I, choose one, I know, I, I know what I'd choose, but well, yeah, but, and I would, I would say that, that probably more than any other language, any other word in the English language, um, or the, the, the most damaging concept in the most damaging concept in human history is the idea of better or worse, hmm. even more than good and bad, better and worse will just fuck you up. It fucks everything up. That's what makes everything happen, though. No, better like, and worse. What do you, What do you mean? How so? Okay. Uh, so, um, I am a peasant who drinks river water that is filled with uh, farm runoff and feces and bacteria, and I I drink a glass of that. Um, then I boil water, and it's completely and perfectly safe, and I drink that. The no, boiled no. water is objectively better than the feces water which is objectively worse and so because of that i decide okay i drink uh this sanitized water and uh my kids don't die at the age of four and i live past 40 and society gets better because i've done something that where i've made a clear decision and a distinction that one thing is better than the other one well no society gets healthier you know um but the the better and worse idea naturally leads to concepts of like, hey, we with this boiled water, we're better than those people over there who have, mm -hmm. who are still, who don't have boiled water yet. You know, th and that's- oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. I mean, like, obviously you're going to choose something that makes you feel healthier and, and live mm -hmm. longer. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a small part of like a large ecosystem of- of thinking you're better than than things uh so yeah i'm thinking like all technology is really driven by deciding that you can do better and then adopting the thing that is better um it's it's better to have uh, a phone in your pocket and be reachable uh, and to communicate anywhere in the world than than it is to not have a phone in your pocket like that's generally what we've decided uh but uh even if, if you're comparing people, though, and, and the way they live, isn't it valid on some level uh, that that it's it's better to do it a certain way than uh, than another? Like, uh, is the very relaxed and charming Canada better than than like Pol Pot's Cambodia? Um, yes, there's and it's, it's hard to have a yes, but there. But ben, can you edit this in in such a way that he's saying yes, Pol Pot's Cambodia is amazing? Because we we just want to cancel you. <laughs> <laughs> we want a cancellation out of this podcast. <laughs> I can I can tell. I mean, you guys are going for the jugular. It's um, <laughs> what but, we do on the Create Unknown. We're we're yeah, a gotcha that's right. podcast. That's so we're funny. famous for ruining careers. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. But I mean. I, I would say Pol Pot is well, is a bad person, but but I right. think extending that to a whole nation um, is is where you is is where you get into real trouble. But you got to do this with your art, though, too, right? Like you, so you you described having a mentor who took you aside and said, "I know what I'm listening to here isn't really you." So you had to decide that me doing what I think is the right thing is not as good as me being me. Like, so what's the push and pull? Like, at some points you you've got to do this, but at the same time, you're right that if you're constantly in this better and worse mindset, you're going to go nowhere. So how do you find a balance? Well, I mean, it's it's not even about finding a balance. It's about you know realizing you don't have to balance. You know, it's. You're stepping off the balance board and and just walking. Um, you know, once you once you get rid of the idea of better and worse, you don't worry. You don't. It's not a, even a negotiation anymore. So, how does this play into um, YouTube having a career? You know, being able to support yourself as an artist because 
you know, when you look at something like the, the Japan video where you're singing Mamma Mia that has 9 million views, and then you do, you know, original music and it doesn't get 9 million views. So how, how do you parse, um, going back to what you said earlier, which is kind of like doing things that will meet people halfway in terms of like getting to know you as an artist and then also you doing things that are just an expression of yourself. And how, and how does making a career out of that uh, fall in line with those values? Well, I mean, I'm never trying to make, I'm, it, again, it's not really a negotiation where I'm going out there and saying like, oh, I think this is what my fans want to hear and then making something. Uh, it does it does come into the equation, but only at the very last stage. You know, if I really am torn between two different things, then maybe as a last, as like a as like a final little thing, I'll say like, okay, like what would the fans rather hear? Like what 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 do I think people want to hear? And then maybe I'll make that choice. Or or make the opposite choice. But it's, you know, an interesting part of the whole ecosystem of, of what I do. You know, and sort of even more than that, it's it's just like a, it's it's like a tool in and of itself. You know, it's a it's a it's a process. It's a it's a concept that's interesting to work with and to think about. Um, but but on the on the on the prior note that you were you were asking about, um, sometimes sometimes you just like you capture lightning in a bottle. You know, it, you do something and it just is like, it just resonates with people. And that, that Mamma Mia video, like people just love it. And it makes me really happy to like have done something that is, that connects with people in such like a weirdly visceral way that I can't really explain. I mean, I, I put, and I think maybe the key is that I didn't, even I didn't make it for anyone other than my friends, you know, I didn't even, I wasn't planning on releasing it. I, my friends saw it and cause I made it for just to have fun. I made it in like two hours. Like it took so, oh, wow. it was, it was so just like, like, Hey, like this would be really a fun thing to do. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, yeah, that was a, a yeah, two I mean, hour start to finish project um it That's was crazy. the 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 music the music took like maybe two hours um and then the okay. the video took maybe like a like you know we shot it over the course of two days but then you know you just put it together there was one draft you know huh. um but i wasn't thinking about making it for other people or like oh what do other people like i was just like trying to make my friends laugh you know I was trying to just make something that was really, really fun. Um, and uh, I think that at the end of the day is, is sort of what comes through and what resonates with people is the, the sheer delight of the idea, you know, of the video. Um, but w was there ever a consideration to like, all right, here's my follow up. I'm going to do Sound of Music in the Alps and I'm going to stand on a mountain and sing something from the sound of music or or here's here's grease on a sand dune you know do you see what i'm getting at well like making it into a series of things right that's right. just like it's that? not it's not interesting to me you know okay um and and i was i was lucky that when that came out people caught on to the rest of my music and now you know i don't i don't i don't have to i don't want to you know it's not it would have to be a really really good idea to 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 do that you know it's like uh yeah I, deruda sandstorm in a sandstorm but come on I think that's part a really of, good idea part of what makes the uh part of what makes the mamma mia video work is that it's not there's no real connection there like it's a bunch of different random shit that's just like all in there it's like a I managed to hit a few different memes at once, sort of by chance. Mm -hmm. You know, ABBA is a it more broadly a meme, and Mamma Mia specifically is is a, like a meme of a song. Yeah. You know, um, Japan 
is definitely uh, like a, a a meme on the internet, you know, as like a concept. Um, at least in a, you know on the American internet, we all recognize that. And it's uh, what else? Like like the video editing style, like the early YouTube two thousand five nostalgia style is sort of a meme. Mm-hmm. Um, and and like having my it's like dads are a meme. You know the fact that. My dad shot it definitely like makes it more and meme worthy. Yeah. yeah. And so it's just like, it was this perfect storm of like stuff that I could never have tried to do. Like it, I could try my whole life and never make something that like just has all of those layers because it would seem insincere. Like ultimately that's the magic of the video is that it's completely and utterly sincere. And and if I were to do another one, it wouldn't be sincere, you know. I I I can't really imagine capturing the that sort of strange magic. Um, just trying to do it on purpose. What do you do when you pour your heart out into a project? You make the thing that you want to want to make, uh, and uh, yeah, we got this in the chat. Is that it's uh, um, you know another way of saying make what you want to see. You know, we hear that kind of thing a lot. Yeah. Uh, what happens when you do that and you put kind of all your vulnerabilities and everything out there and nobody cares because this is something that just comes up with creatives all the time. They've been doing this. They've been grinding away and, uh, it just doesn't have the traction. What do you do to get through that, that process? Um, well, you know, I think ultimately you have to just think about it. You're just making stuff for you. You're making stuff for your for your friends and your your family. Um, if your friends and family don't care about what you're doing, then you should find new friends, um, mm. because good friends will always care about what you're doing no matter what, um, and like what you're doing no matter what because you made it. Uh, right. They'll want and, to see you happy and, and doing yeah, things that make yeah, you happy. Exactly. And the, but at the end of the day, like if, if like a random guy on the street doesn't like what I'm doing, like that's fine. It just, it just doesn't, it shouldn't matter. You know, I, I mean, it's, and that's definitely something that everyone who makes stuff struggles with, you know, it's really easy to, to sit here and say like, Hey, like if, if like, man on the street doesn't like it then doesn't matter it's super easy to say in practice really hard you know um it just yeah it's something that i think everyone who makes stuff struggles with no matter what level of making stuff they're on it's Mm -hmm. it's tough you can you can't you can be the most famous and and well-renowned person in the world and uh i mean i've talked to some of them and you know, even even they are sometimes unsatisfied with with stuff, and so it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you're always it's you're ne- you're never going to be fully satisfied. It's it's more of a it's a it's an internal choice you have to make to 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 be happy in in that regard. Well, when it comes to funding your projects, though, like I I wonder what your thoughts are on being able to do that because. Your music videos are beautiful. Like the the the, the music yeah. videos you've been putting out lately are are not schlocky like slap together things. They are really well shot. Like the the <laughs> Thank the, you. the they're really well edited. There are yeah. props involved, and <laughs> you know there's a lot going into it. You look at the credits and you're like, oh wow, okay, a dozen people helped make this music video. Um, yeah. Unless you have like a lot of really talented friends with nothing else to do who will do that all for free, you're going to so, have to fund funny, this somehow, funny right? Funny you should bring that up because I have a lot of really talented friends who will do stuff for free. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got I got incredibly lucky um, in in the in the friends that I have, and we're all always working on each other's projects. So, like, you know, I just got off set last week. I was on set all week on one of my best friends, short movies. You know, I wasn't asking to get paid because when he works on my stuff, I don't pay. He doesn't ask to get paid. And so we have this huge ecosystem of, of like 
doing shit for each other that uh um just works you know but but then also you know the the other advantage i have is that i'm i'm totally independent as an artist you know i i have my own record label um that i own and all of the streaming royalties go to me 100 percent you know all of the youtube royalties go to me 100 percent um and when i sell merch like that all goes into funding this stuff. And so because there's no middleman, you know, economically, uh, the, the bottom line is way better. And so that, that also mm -hmm. goes a long way uh, to funding stuff. Uh, why'd you choose to go that 100% independent route? Well, you know, at first it was out of necessity uh, because, okay. you know, everyone starts out 100% independent. Um, but then, uh, then it, now it's just out of fun. You know, I can do whatever the hell I want all the time. Uh, you know, I, I have complete artistic yeah. control and freedom over everything I do. And that's something which I'm just so grateful for. Um, and I feel very lucky to have that. Uh, you know, the, I, I guess you, one could say that the fans found me before the record labels did. And so... You know, hmm. I'm sticking with the fans. That makes sense. You met you mentioned uh, this this broad network of other artists and creatives. This is something oh. that that I hear a lot from, uh, you know, from the the younger people who are getting started in their respective spaces. Like they want to be in a network. They want to meet uh, friends who are like them. You know, they want to uh, come across other talented people and just have this friend circle. How do you do that? How do you get to a point where you're meeting other people like you? Um, you just got to go out there and, and, and meet a lot of people. I mean, I was really lucky. Just go do stuff. That. Yeah. You go do stuff. My, I met the foundations of the rest of my life crew in college, you know? So that's sort mm -hmm. of a, that was a, that was a good time to, I don't know. I mean, like I went to art school and so, or, you know, I didn't go to art school, but I was an art major. And so all my friends from the classes went on to also make art and make music and make movies and stuff. And then, you know, yeah. you, you make stuff with other people and then you meet their friends and then you meet their friends. And over time, you know, you're, you're part of this big uh, ecosystem of people. But it, it all comes That's, from like doing stuff, you know, you just got to go out there and do stuff and, and never say no to a project or, or to mm -hmm. a, to a meeting or to drinks or anything. Showing up seriously is a, a really big deal. And we've talked on, on past episodes, like in regards to VidCon with YouTube, that there are fewer ways to show up and run into people and talk to them and, and kind of build friendships and stuff in this industry than some of the others. Yeah. Um, but you, you got to You got to show up. It sounds so simple, but you have to do things in person oh, yeah. here and there. Like if possible, it, it's possible to do it without, uh, without that. And some people have, you know, all sorts of limitations and circumstances in their life that make it very difficult to, you know, pop into some of those events. Uh, so you can do it without, without that but uh you just got to show up somehow whether it's an online thing whether it's uh um an in-person thing and a specific example to us is tom videoger is in the chat here i've mentioned him a few times because he shows up most weeks and uh pops pops links in as we talk about things well that that sticks in our minds you know the people who do stuff like that uh they're on the tip of your tongue and brain uh, when you're thinking of people for different sorts of projects and mm -hmm. that happens because he shows up and does something and you don't know what it's going to lead to it may lead to nothing, but you keep doing that and doing that. And, uh, you, you start to, you start to meet people. That's a good thing. Yeah. hundred percent. It's the only way to fly. The, um, the thing I want to circle back a second to something that I I've always wondered and, um, because we haven't had a lot of uh, music guests on this podcast. You know, we, we did have uh, Hot Dad on a while back, but this, this never came up. And that's Spotify CPMs and YouTube oh, yeah. CPMs. What's a CPM? Uh, our, 
So it's the the essentially the amount of money per 1000 plays that you would get oh, okay. on a YouTube yeah. video compared to Spotify. How how do those compare? Because I've read some stuff that the the Spotify CPM seem to be like 3 or 4 times higher than the YouTube CPMs. Is that true? Yeah, that's that's basically true. Um Spotify pays me way more than YouTube does. Um also, more people listen on Spotify to my stuff than I have more, you know, listens slash views per day on Spotify than YouTube, I think. Um, but yeah, Spotify pays out like way more than YouTube does. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, because I had seen some stuff uh, complaining about the Spotify CPMs, and and when the person mentioned what they what what we are, what they are. As a YouTuber, I was like, I would love if the YouTube CPMs were that high. <laughs> Holy cow. Like, this yeah. is what you're mad but about? But I mean, even, like, even Spotify geez. CPMs are way lower than every other streaming service. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so like, Apple Music is much higher? Yeah, 100%. Way higher. And and sort of wow. another, another point of stuff is that the rate of, like, creation is so much lower in music than it is with like, you know, vlogging or podcasting, um, that, that it, you know, I don't know it, it's, it, I think it would be like to make a living on YouTube, you need to upload something like once a week. It's crazy. You have to upload something once a week that does really well, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, which is, which is crazy. And I, I, I thought about trying to do that for a while, but I don't, I, that's just not how I work best. Like I, I, you know, every 10 weeks I can put 10 things out, but I can't do one thing every week for 10 weeks. That seems crazy. Right. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And I had, I had wondered, um, about, um, streaming like on Twitch, for example, like, do you allow people to, uh, cause I never quite understood this. Cause I've heard a little bit about like the, the DMCA stuff when it comes to like streamers, for example, like would you, and do you allow Twitch streamers to play your music or, or not? I, I've never really understood that whole thing. I, I always tell them, okay. yeah, go, go play it. Yeah. Cause, cause I've, I heard of a, a musician, uh, maybe he's a YouTuber. I don't know. I'm butchering this because it's like a, a friend of a friend of a friend um, who makes a living just allowing and publicizing his music to be played in Twitch streams. Huh. That's yeah. really interesting. That's really, because really these interesting. Stream, these streamers will stream for 10 hours a day. It's, they need a lot of music to fill that. And if you are a musician, um, like you'd be almost crazy not to allow that to happen because that's a lot of plays. It's just a lot of background music that they need while they're doing stuff all day. Yeah, hundred percent. I never thought about it economically like that, but yeah, whenever people email me asking if they can use my songs in their Twitch streams, I always say yes because yeah, of course they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I don't know. That's just like a little pro tip for uh, any like musicians out there, any independent musicians out there. It could be a good revenue source for you. I mean, I, I don't know people on Twitch. I don't know how you could really get the word out on getting streamers to stream. Or getting Twitch streamers to stream your music while they are streaming. Just saying stream a lot. Um, but it's almost like a baked in way to get your Spotify stream up or your Apple or, um, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, Matt, do we have questions to ask um, to ask Austin before we let him go from, from our patrons? We do. Yes, we do. Um, eh, I've got to order these in... Real time. This one is actually on what we we're just talking about. Uh, Isaac asked if you get anything for having your songs on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, I do. Oh, TikTok uh, it pays artists who who have their music on them. I, I almost, I almost nothing. I think. I mean, my stuff hasn't been popular enough on uh -huh. TikTok to really be paying attention to it. Not to say I haven't been trying to make it more popular on TikTok. For those of you out there, please go make my music very popular on TikTok. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> um ben who producer ben uh has has a couple and they're pretty good uh the first one is is if you had to pursue a medium other than music what would it be um 
I'd probably be making, well, just the other stuff I do. I guess I would just have to stop doing music. Um, What's plan B? <laughs> if there is one. <laughs> um, I don't know. If, if the music stuff really fails and I need to get a day job, uh, I'd try to find something that I could make uh, the most money possible doing so that I would have more money to make music. It's that, uh, Kevin, it's the classic, like sling chicken wings to support your art, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have the artist disease, you, you do whatever you can <laughs> to feed yeah. the monster. I mean, yeah, either yeah. the, the two good jobs are either doing what you love or doing something that lets you do what you love. So I just try to find something that, that let sense. me make music. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of the, sp- when I say small YouTubers, I mean like small in the sense that it's not quite yet viable for them to have a full-time income where they can pay normal bills and all that, but they're making a few bucks. Uh, and uh, a lot of them try to flip that switch a little too soon. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I like hearing somebody just say, Hey, I'd, I'd rather have a job that, that fuels uh, me being able to do this. And then if at a certain point becomes viable and you can switch over, then, uh, you know, then you do it. But uh, like Sumet, uh, Sumetto Media uh, described this. He he worked for years uh, as he as he built up his, his streaming and YouTube stuff, and then eventually made the switch. Um, yeah. Where where does most? If you guys okay. don't mind me asking, where does where does most yeah. of your uh, revenue come from? In the I don't know anything about the podcasting business. Oh, uh, with podcasting, it is generally audio ads. I mean, they're the kind of things that. You know, you you read a little thing and they yeah. uh, put it in a couple of the ad breaks. Um, that's that's really most of it. I mean, uh, Patreon is really big for so many podcasts. It's critical for us. Uh, yeah. That's what allowed us to go uh, as as long as we have. So building a community there. Um, but you know, if you're like H three or something, uh, or Joe Rogan, you know, you're getting. Yeah, that's oh, all ad you, money. You've got revenue streams from <laughs> yeah, uh, tremendous ad money and and sponsorship deals and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of podcasting people are in that balance. Like it's hard to make enough money with a podcast to do it full time. Uh, we certainly you know don't do it full time, uh, and it would be a hell of a stretch to to get there. Um, so you do other things. I mean, yeah. Kevin and I are living this in a way. We have day jobs that allow us to play around with a, with a great podcast yeah i mean and that's uh john philip glass worked for years as a taxi driver so there's no hmm. even when he was a famous composer <laughs> oh wow. no kidding yeah famous famous stories about music critics getting into a cab and being like the fuck <laughs> what are you doing here <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there's it's all uh yeah it's, that's the that's the gig man <laughs> Well, this one's about the future. Do you have anything on the horizon that you can you can talk about? Because we are it does appear that we are coming out of uh, the covid hellscape to some degree. So are there possible tours, new records, projects, anything in the brave new world? So I'm, I'm working I'm working on a record right now. You can you can see you can see it on my wall. Um, and, uh, you know, that'll hopefully come out this fall. But more. More importantly, and more funly, um, I'll be back on the road in October. Uh, have a bunch of hey dates yo. lined up across the country. Going to announce those soon. You know, get your get your get your pre sales going. Um, but yeah, I'm incredibly stoked to get out on the road again. I mean, playing shows is my favorite part of my job, and it's just so much freaking fun. What did you do when you couldn't? I mean, it must be it must have been like 16 months since you did it last, right? Yeah, you know. Uh, I did a bunch of live streaming shows, which have been pretty popular, Mm -hmm. which I've been really happy about. Um, But other than that, you know, it's just like pining for the fjords. You know, there's not much you can do except except uh, try and plan the most kick ass tour you can for when it all peters out. (laughs) That's what you've done. You said October, right? Yeah, October. Excellent. Um, Let me see. There's 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 a bizarre one from. Marco about why I look like a villain who hasn't established his presence yet in, in the movie. Ugh, my lighting is bonkers. I, I unplugged one of my lights um, that usually illuminates me from the front and I forgot to plug it in. I didn't notice because the sun was still up, uh, but I, I would be the most boring villain in any movie because 
in the back, there are like six boxes of filing supplies. <laughs> you know what, Marco? Villains don't have an array of hanging folders as weapons. <laughs> I don't know what kind of movies you watch, uh, but your your head's in the wrong space. Um, okay, you said that that you've been making music for as long as you can remember. Has there been a song, record, a band that has continually been an influence from the beginning through the whole writing journey? Um. I mean, a lot, a lot. I mean, a lot of the stuff I grew up listening to, I still listen to. Um, my, 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 I mean, the stuff my mom and dad listened to when I was growing up. Uh, my mom loves, uh, her favorite genres are, are, are dual. She loves uh, musical theater and um, uh, punk rock uh, and like 90s alt stuff. That's a combo. Oh, it's fucking cool as hell. And so, when I was driving with her in the car, I would I would either listen to you know Les Mis or uh, Miss Saigon or uh, Oklahoma, or we'd be listening to like The Clash and REM. Uh, and so I, I hold all of those. Uh, you know, The Clash is probably top is like a tier one uh, reference for me at all times. They're just the the fucking best, man. Um, uh, and uh especially their late stuff like sandinista i've been playing on repeat for the last month or so um and uh know, my dad with my dad i grew up listening to just like a ton of classic rock radio stations you know when you're driving through connecticut next you know turn into 95.1 the fox uh, fairfield county's only classic rock mm. you know grew up listening to a lot of the who boston um I think the first record that I really loved as a, as a whole piece, um, the two first records I really loved were uh, who's next and Boston's eponymous record. Um, you know, and I still, still listen to those undeniably good stuff. Um, but yeah, that's, Boston are... is great. Uh, barbecuing music, by the way, oh, if I'm yeah. grilling some burgers. You throw some Boston on the mood is set. Yeah. Hugely good for barbecuing. <laughs> <laughs> this one is is a two-parter uh-huh first one's the easier part what's your favorite type of ice cream oh you see that's the harder part <laughs> oh that's that's the harder part oh i don't even know what the other half of the question is it can't be harder than that um <laughs> the last what, the last what are the options what are the what are the top options oh i i, I fucking love ice cream man ice cream's the best it's so hard to choose. I mean, I've recently had sort of a renaissance of peanut butter flavored ice creams. Um, yes. I'm on, so I'm on yes. sort of a wave of that. Mint chip is sort of a perennial favorite, as is, you know, chocolate and coffee. Um, Good classics. I mean, I could just, I'm just listing all the ice cream flavors now. Um, I, sort of a go-to order is, is mint chip with hot fudge and rainbow sprinkles in a waffle cup or waffle cone is uh is uh always a go-to um but uh, yeah i i I love ice cream i i couldn't possibly pick a favorite um but what's the second half uh second half is this is our last one here uh what do you recommend to content creators who are struggling to enjoy what they're making make something else how do you how do you flip the switch though? How do you decide like I have to pull the plug on what I'm doing to do something else? How do you do it? If like, you're not if you're not enjoying it, no one else will. How much time do you give it though? So like uh like I've seen different creators have have a problem where they're not enjoying it, but it's not because of what they're doing, it's because of how they're doing it. So like That's there's true. something in their process that that makes them hate it. Let's say that somebody loves writing and performing videos, but they hate sitting down to edit the videos. Well, if they got an editor, then that problem is gone and they enjoy what they're doing. Like how, how can you tell if something is a bad fit for you versus there's a problem within it that you need to work out and how long do you give it? Um, well, I mean, it's all about sort of, well, once you, once you realize something isn't working, you should stop doing that immediately. You know, once you once you realize you're you're fighting a losing battle just change the battle you know there's no you should never spend time sort of running up against a brick wall uh that you're not going to break uh and then it's all about thinking critically about what you like what you don't like how you work best and uh trying to maximize the ways in which you work best and minimize the ways in which you work uh less well 
Um, so like and a good example is one of the greatest writing writers and, and literary minds of all time, uh, John Schwartzwelder, the, the Simpsons writer. And, uh, and Oh, Kevin, you sent that article to me by him the other day, didn't you? Oh my God. Everyone needs to read yeah, his yeah. New Yorker interview. It is yeah, like, great. so I, I come from a, a part of a huge part of my scene is comedy writers. Um, and we all just sort of worship John Schwartzwelder. He is the <laughs> funniest guy who's ever lived. It's crazy. I think I even mentioned him earlier in this interview describing the two fat guys on the motorcycles um, as something he would have. <laughs> you did, yeah. He would have written. Yeah, I was going to yeah. bring up that article because I, I, I assumed it was fresh in your mind since it just came out. Yeah, but anyway, uh, he, he has an interesting ago. Uh, quip in there where he uh, he's like, yeah, I hate writing but i'm i'm a terrible i hate writing but i'm really good at editing and so that what he does mm. is he writes as fast as he can just in one <laughs> night he just like gets it over with he writes total shit but then he can do what he's good at which is editing and then he can make something great um and you know i mean kevin how finding nuts little is this? tricks like that how nuts is this that he's he's bringing that up right now yeah, we literally talked about it the other day. I sent I sent Matt that excerpt exactly. Oh, that's so exactly. funny. Word for word, that passage about the writing and editing <laughs> thing. Yeah. 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 But I mean, like, you know, it's you have to think critically about advice. your own process and then and then learn how to work best. Mm -hmm. Like uh like Vonnegut. Chinchilla has Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, go on. Oh no. Well, Chinchilla has a follow up to this about the process, saying, What if somebody enjoys the process that they're in, but then the product they don't like it or it's just not quite what they intended. How do you, how do you take the process you enjoy and generate something you enjoy as much? Um, I, I, that's a, that's interesting. Um, that's a weird situation. That's, but, that's a weird situation. You know, it's all kind of like generally, yeah, it seems generally related to me in that, uh, you know, it's working out kinks in, in the whole thing, uh, so that you feel good from beginning to end or at least at the end about what you went through yeah i mean that's a hard that's a hard one um that is a stumper that's a yeah that's a that's a stumper i mean then maybe you shake up the process you know mm -hmm. even if even if you enjoy it i mean it, it behooves everyone to shake up the process you know i i wrote my last record in, in sort of a um uh yeah i i like after i finished the last record uh out in la i i'm right now i'm living I'm living in New York for the next few months. I just got a little sublet in the East Village, um, and oh, cool! And like working in a totally different space with you know different people around me, and um, you know going from having like a like a like a nice big studio with all sorts of random s stuff in it uh, to um, like like a, a very tiny half of this room where my head hits one side of the wall, my feet hit the other when I lie down in bed. Um, and you know that's that's a huge process shift is like limiting what you can do um and so that was something you know overall it's about thinking critically about your own process um and and sort of using that thinking outside yourself and then you know th what can i change mm -hmm. uh, yeah that's and, that's and, a and tough sometimes one. i think yeah setting up um like kind of like guidelines for yourselves or restrictions can allow for new ideas to flow. Oh, it always and, um, does. And it's, that, it's a good, a good way of shaking things up. Yeah. yeah. It's like almost arbitrarily forcing yourself to do that. So, um, yeah. well, listen, man, this was great. Uh, I don't think yeah. that we have had a guest where we went so deep into like the processes no. of artistry before. So this was a really nice discussion because I, I love hearing that kind of stuff. I dig it. Yeah. I'm into it. Um, it applies to everybody too, whether you're doing music, you're doing YouTube stuff, you're writing, you're gardening. I mean, there's artistry in everything. And so much of what you talked about is just generally applicable to pretty much everything that happens once you get out of bed in the morning. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. So I would recommend at this point, having learned what we just learned, that everyone listen to uh, Austin Weber's music on Apple Music, if you have it. Uh, you know, that's that's S tier. Uh, yeah. Then A tier would be uh, <laughs> Spotify if you're a Spotify person. And then last but not least, you know, YouTube, if you're only on there and you need to get your Austin Weber fix, definitely subscribe on YouTube. Check him out. Uh, Weber is W-E-B-E-R. 
and he's got some some vinyl records on his website. You can also yeah, that's purchase, that's true. Yeah. S tier stuff is the is the vinyl. Vinyl is S plus yeah. plus tier. <laughs> Spin those vinyl records. We have we have a bunch of uh, vinyl fans in our we community, do. so that is definitely a real possibility. Um, but overall, man, thank you so much for for being on the show and joining us, and it was a pleasure talking to you. Oh yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I've I've loved every second. Awesome, awesome, and thanks to all of our patrons for hanging out with us. Yeah, the, gar- our, the, the baby, our, our and garbage the tra- people, garbage. <laughs> baby gang. Yeah, our trash children, our baby <laughs> gang. <laughs> um, we are here every Wednesday night, six p.m. Eastern, live on Discord. If you want to chat with us, just become a patron. Go to patreon.com slash the create unknown and join us until next time though we will see you space cowboys thanks for listening to the create unknown we'd like to extend a huge thank you and congratulations to the tots and dumpster crew who save tiny little lives every month a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang Trevstad, Boromir, Bot Dogs, Chinchilla, Isaac, Conrad, James, Jeff Davis, Patrick Pister, Baseweight, and Dojangles. And thank you to our grizzled, battle hardened child infantry Jen Mefisanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Risebread, Sean Malone, Triple Question Mark, Monaghan, Ryan Kinder, Sheep, and Maruko. Thank you as well to our producer and editor Ben Webster and to our media manager Dan Yosua. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production. <laughs>